My name is Jennifer Close. I work at the GFIT Fitness Centers, and we're kind of holding this uh, uh, bone, bone safe yoga presentation. And we're going to introduce, uh, we have Kathleen Cody and Shelly, Shelly Powers from the American Bone Health. And we also have Annie Appleby, who is from Yoga Force, and she's also one of our Google instructors. So let's welcome them and enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everybody, for coming. So we're going to talk today about bone safe yoga. And how many people who are already doing yoga want to be doing yoga in 10 years? Okay, so this is great because there's a lot of things that are in yoga and the practice of yoga that as you get older, you need to start thinking about how you modify those so that you don't injure yourself. And in particular, for, from a bone health perspective, we want to prevent fractures. So today we're going to talk about how to do yoga safely uh, and so you can do it for the rest of your life. And Annie's, we're going to kind of flip back and forth. Annie's going to demonstrate what to do and what not to do when we get to some of the pretty standard yoga poses. And I'm going to run through some slides to talk a little bit about bone health and osteoporosis. So first of all, I just wanted to let you know that uh, I'm the executive director of American Bone Health, and we are based in Oakland, California, and we're a public education organization. We're a nonprofit, and we train volunteers to go out into the community and do talks like this, do workshops, all kinds of things that can help people learn about how to keep their bones strong and healthy as they age. So osteoporosis is a skeletal disease. It happens throughout the body. It generally starts in your spine and kind of works its way out. It's characterized by reduced bone mass, and the bones get fragile. So if you can see the slide, the picture on the left, is that your left, is a picture of normal bone density. And you can see there's a nice, strong um, connection between all of the matrix inside the bone. When you start losing bone mass, that you start to lose the structure, the internal structure of the bone, and it starts becoming very fragile looking. And that's what we're trying to prevent uh, as we get older. So I just wanted to give you some sense of what happens to bone. A lot of people think it's kind of a, a static, hard surface that's nothing's going on, but it's actually quite metabolically active. And between the ages around uh, 15 to 25 are your biggest bone building years. In fact, kids in their nine, in, when they're 9 to 14 build more bone than they ever lose in their entire lifetime. So you can see that slope in the early ages uh, is increasing, is where you're really acquiring a lot of bone mass. And by the time you're about 30, you've reached as much bone as you're ever going to build in your lifetime. So at that point, you really want to try to think about how do you preserve the bone that you got. So when you're a kid, you need to figure out how do I get as much bone as I can. And then when you get to be about 30, you want to figure out how do I keep that bone. So when we reach menopause, for most women, that's around 51 average age, there's a rapid period of bone loss that's associated with the reduction in estrogen in your body. And then after you've kind of leveled off the estrogen, you start seeing continued bone loss as you get older, but the, the rate of bone loss kind of slows down a bit. So what we want to do when we think about preventing osteoporosis and preventing fractures is really trying to maximize our bone throughout our lifetime. So these are some of the risk factors uh, for osteoporosis. And some of them are you can do something about it, and other things you really can't. So women tend to have uh, more uh, osteoporosis than men. About 80% of the people with osteoporosis are women. It's because of the estrogen factor. Um, hereditary has a lot, of, a lot to do with bone health. If your mother or father or grandmother or grandfather had osteoporosis or fractures, you've got probably a 65% likelihood that you inherited their genes. So you really, if you look to your parents, you can kind of get a picture of what you might be looking at as you get older. Um, age is certainly a risk factor. Smoking and alcohol are things we can really modify. Smoking affects estrogen in the body, so if we can get people to quit smoking, it really has a positive impact on bone. Alcohol, moderate alcohol consumption may be okay, but anything more than three drinks a day is a risk factor for fractures. Um, calcium and low vitamin D. Ooh, I don't see calcium on there. But low vitamin D and chronically uh, low, there it is, 
dietary intake of calcium. The bones are, are made up largely of calcium, and if you're not providing them with calcium throughout your life, uh, you're going to be at risk for bone loss. And then being physically inactive, which is one of the reasons we're here today, is we really want to try to maintain our yoga practices and go, go on doing things the right way so that we don't um, increase our risk for having fractures. Uh, this is a slide, not to, to confuse you too much, but just to let people know that there are a lot of things that affect bone health. And these are some of the medications and medical conditions that can cause bone loss. And there's a whole wide range of them. And I think people don't realize often enough that other things that are going on in their bodies are, are affecting their bones. And so just to make, be aware of this, steroids tends to be the most common cause of pretty rapid bone loss. So anybody who's got some kind of medical condition that requires the use of oral steroids really needs to be thinking about what kind of what's happening uh, to their bones. So we're going to talk uh, just for a couple of slides about calcium, vitamin D, and then we're going to get into some yoga. Uh, these are the keys, too. The principal keys uh, for bone health is calcium and vitamin D, and they work together. You need to have the vitamin D to metabolize the calcium. The Institute of Medicine is recommending about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium every day. There's some controversy right now around calcium supplements, so we like to tell people try to get it in your diet. That'd be about three to four servings of a calcium-rich food. And so start paying attention to the labels when you're, when you're in the grocery store. Um, vitamin D, you don't need as much unless you have, a, have issues or concerns about your bone health. But you can check with your doctor about whether or not you should be concerned about getting your vitamin D level tested. And you do need weight-bearing exercise because the, the bones, just like muscles, respond to impact. So anything that requires gravity, if it's the force of your body or weights, is really good for stimulating the bone building cells. So we want to do that, but we want to do that safely. So in talking about tips for using exercise to strengthen your bones, we really want to focus on the bones that we're trying to strengthen. So if it's legs, we're going to do leg strengthening exercises. If it's the trunk, we want to do, uh, we want to do exercises that impact the spine. Uh, you want to work until the muscles get kind of uh, tired and quivery uh, within 10 repetitions. So it's better to do heavier weight, less time than a lot of repetitions with little weight. That really helps stimulate the bone building cells. Two to three times a week is optimal. This is probably untested. There's not really very much scientific evidence to support any of this, but most people are saying two to three times a week is the best thing to do. And then a lot of the exercise people now are saying you really need to kind of change your workout routine about once a year because your body kind of acclimates to what you're doing. And if you don't change it up, it just kind of goes into um, just a mode of not really doing anything different. So think about changing your routine about once a year. So today we're going to talk about yoga, preventing fractures, and some of the principles of bone-safe yoga. So you all know this because you're all yogis, right? Of course. So it means uh, union in Sanskrit, and it's uh, a system of postures or asanas that are practiced to promote spiritual insight, tranquility, and control of the body and mind. That sounds kind of nice. It also happens to be really good for your bone health. So here are some of the benefits of the different aspects of yoga for your bones. So when you're practicing postures that involve alignment, it really helps uh, prevent spine fractures because Annie's going to talk about this in a minute, how the importance of alignment and making sure that you're doing the posture uh, in a way that is protecting your spine. Awareness, so as you practice yoga and you start getting this mind-body connection, uh, that awareness of yourself, your body, and your surroundings really helps prevent falls and helps you uh, promote better posture. Balance, which is really kind of one of the fundamental principles 
that you and the benefits you get from yoga helps to prevent falls. And if you can prevent falls, you can usually for prevent having a fracture. Uh, it is also weight bearing, and the weight bearing aspect of uh, yoga will help strengthen the muscles. And as you strengthen muscles, the muscles pull on the bone, and that's what stimulates the bone building cells. And then finally, there's a, we're going to talk a little bit in a, uh, about extension exercises, which is bending backwards. We always want to avoid bending forward because that puts too much stress on those spine bones. So bending backward really helps protect the bones in the vertebrae. So there, yoga, all those great things about yoga, but there's also some dangers that everybody needs to be aware of, especially uh, as you get older. There are a lot of yoga postures that involve extreme spinal flexion, side bending, and rotation. So as Annie starts to sh demonstrate how these postures are with a proper way to do them so that you can protect yourself, you want to think about things like not, not doing too much forward flexion, and there's ways to modify those postures to, pr to protect your spine. So as you get older, and you'll notice this now that we've talked about it, that there's this kind of stooped posture that people get as they get older. And partly, some of us who are younger get it too, just because we're always hunched over our computers, or we're hunched over our driving our steering wheels. And we have this kind of slumped for head forward posture. And what we want to do with the practice of yoga is really reverse that posture and make sure that we're sitting upright and we're maintaining a good, strong, strong spine. So we don't want to, um, we don't want to compound the, the, the forward rounding with adding flexion from yoga on top of it. Um, this is uh, uh, the third bullet here is from one of the, our board members who is a physical therapist, and she believes that uh, any woman who's postmenopausal should not participate in a general yoga class uh, without knowing what her bone density is. So it really kind of helps you to be aware of what your bone density is before you start doing some activity that might put your bones at risk for having a fracture. And then everybody needs to really modify uh, their practice to prevent any fractures. So if you've got low bone mass or osteoporosis, you need extra precautions. Has anybody in here had a bone density test? Yes? OK. One person. One person here. I don't know about all the people on the screen. but So this is a, a, a diagram, or it's not. It's a model of a spine. And you can see the, uh, if you can see the, the vertebrae that are in the lumbar spine, which is closer to the pelvis are much bigger bones. And they're, they're picking up a lot of weight from your body. And that's where most of the weight is transferred. You can see that the bones that are closer to the neck start to get pretty small. Those are the bones that are between your shoulder blades and their, your rib cage is kind of hooked onto them. And if you add that forward flexion, so this person is pulling the spine in a forward flexion movement, uh, you can see how much pressure is put on those, those bones in the thoracic spine, which is the, the part to the left, the smaller bones. And it's also putting some torsion, torque on the lower lumbar spine vertebrae, too. Uh, this is a pretty dramatic view of what happens to one of those vertebrae in your spine if you put some pressure on it when you've lost some bone mass. And most of the time we hear from people who have vertebral fractures, they don't even know they're happening. Uh, somebody might hear, you know, they might be twisting or sneeze or pick something up from a cupboard and they'll hear something kind of crack. And uh, once, once it cracks, it starts kind of a cascade for people. And, and if you notice some older adults who have the, the big uh, kind of hump on their back, they call it a dowager's hump. That's most of the time vertebral fractures that are happening in those bones in the thoracic spine between your vertebrae. And it's because what, what used to be a square bone now has, has been crushed because of forward flexion. And you get a stack of triangles instead of a stack of squares. So that's what starts to cause that, that rounding in the back. 
So anybody who's losing, if you know anybody who's older, who's starting to lo get shorter, about an inch and a half, anybody who's lost more than an inch and a half of height is probably having spinal fractures. Anything less than an inch and a half, it's, you know, it's the kind of the compression of the uh, discs between the bones and may not, um, may not be spinal fractures. But anybody who's, who's shrunk more than an inch and a half probably should be checked. And so this is the progression of what we call kyphosis. It's that increasing uh, number of fractures in the bones of the thoracic spine between the, the shoulders. And so you can see the cartoon at the top. The, the woman farthest to the left has kind of got this nice straight alignment and posture. And as she starts to get spinal fractures, she starts to get a little bit shrinking, shrinking. And then by the time she's got another 10 years have passed, she's got that severe osteoporosis. And what's really, what's really devastating and sad is that people don't usually complain about pain from this kind of thing. They, compa they complain about losing height. They complain about not being able to breathe because all of your organs that used to have this nice place to live, now as you get shorter and shorter, all kind of pooch out through your belly. And so they can't breathe. They can't really eat. They don't have an appetite. Their digestive tract is all screwed up. So it's a really, it's a really crappy way to, to finish out a long life. So we really want to prevent this from happening. So you'll start to notice some of these poses that are actually really good for bone health. Anything that has to do with spinal extension. And this, this looks like a cobra, kind of a modified cobra pose, and it's, it's really good. And this, there was a study that was done that showed that even some moderate use of this kind of a posture can have uh, long-lasting effects. It, they measured these, these, uh, these patients out 10 years, and they still, had, they still were able to maintain their bone density. So now we're going to start doing, and we we're probably going to get you guys up off your chairs so you can practice a little bit with Annie. So we're going to start with bone safe principle number one, which is all about alignment. Yeah, so do you want to talk about alignment then? Good. So Mr. Ops, can we, can we go back to the camera? Yeah. Hold on one second. You'll see me in a second. Okay, my name is Annie Appleby, and I own a company called Yoga Force, uh, www.yogaforce.com, and I also teach here actually today, um, Tuesday, 4 to 5, over at the gym next to Building 43. If you want to come in, in today, that'd be great. Feet placement is very important. And um, I also teach little kids yoga, and one little girl started crying because she said, I can't get my feet to, or my toes to all line up because they're all different sizes. So what I say now is try to get your feet together and get your big toes to line up. So if you guys want to stand up, this really is important. And a lot of yoga teachers don't spend any time about your feet. Your feet and your toes are extremely important. So what you want to do is you want to press all four corners of each foot firmly into the floor. Like you're actually getting energy from the earth and you're going to pull it up your legs. This gives you good posture and you can see the difference in my posture in one second. So I'm going to get my third toes down into the floor. My feet are s kind of smashed into the earth. I'm going to pull energy up my legs. I'm going to rotate my tailbone under and push my butt forward. I'm going to pull my stomach in and up. I'm going to lift my rib cage as high up off of my hips as possible. And then I'm going to go shoulders up and back and down. And you want your neck to be really straight. So figure out where your face is going to go. So you want to kind of pull your skull up and away from your heels. It's hard to do it when I'm holding this microphone. But see the difference? Your chest is out. You're very actressy or very presidentially <laughs> because all your power is coming from your sternum plate. So remember, you lift up and out of your sternum plate, and you're taking all the pressure off of your lower discs and vertebrae. And you can breathe in between them. So what I, what I do in the yoga classes is you close your eyes, because if you shut down one sense, you can concentrate on the other senses. And you're going to breathe in from your ankles all the way to your skull. 
So you breathe in, about five counts, breathe out, about seven counts. So it's like this. And it's all nose breathing in yoga. And you do not want your teeth to touch. No upper teeth touch bottom teeth. You want to keep a space there so you have no pressure in your jaw. It's really, really, really good. You want to throw your shoulders up and back and down. And with just three deep breaths, you can really feel good if you have to do a presentation. <laughs> okay, so let's try to do three deep breaths. Close your eyes. Breathe right into your brain. Okay, now you can open your eyes and blink. Okay, now this works at home. I am very short. I'm like 5'3", and I like to be tall, so I always carry myself up, so I, people think I'm a lot taller than I am. But when I'm in the kitchen and I reach for spice, I can never reach it. So I hold my breath, and I can never reach it. But look what happens when I breathe. You can actually reach things. So that's just a practical thing about yoga. Now, we have feet positioning when you're doing a yoga pose. So you guys can probably sit down now. Um, this mat uh, is patented because I got in an automobile accident and my whole body was completely out of alignment, so I had to put it back in alignment. You'll see there's stripes. So when I teach classes at Oracle and Google especially, because it's for people who work and they, you know, they need to understand yoga, but maybe they don't have enough time to go more than once a week. So it's very important to get your front foot perfectly straight in warrior one and warrior two. And then your back foot is going to go, so your heel draws a line into your back middle arch. That gives you stability so you don't fall over. You're going to want to walk your foot out so your tibia is straight. You don't want your knee to hyperextend or underextend because it's really bad for your knee. You also want, when you're opening up your hips, you want to always open up your knee to the little toe side. If you can see what I'm doing, I'm opening up my knee to my little toe side. So that would be warrior two. And then warrior one, or you can come on your back foot. But you're, you're kind of twisting, which is OK. This is a safe twist. Now I'm going to show you another safe twist. It's called triangle pose. Kathleen, can you hold on to this? Because I don't think I can do triangle pose. OK, so what you're going to do, again, you want to get very good stability with your feet. Your back foot's at a 45 degree angle. Your front foot is perfectly straight. You're putting all your weight on your whole foot. Make sure that no toe gets more um, energy than another toe. Then you're going to slide into it. And I'm going to do straight leg uh, triangle. So I'm going to go over here. And you can touch the top of your leg, or you can touch the bottom of your leg. But you cannot put your hand right on top of your kneecap because it puts way too much pressure on your knee. So either underneath on your calf muscle or your shin, and you're going to push your butt forward and open up your chest to the ceiling, OK? But never, hand never on your knee. If you cannot quite touch the, you know, your calf, go ahead and feel confident that you can push your hand right on top of your leg. That's good for you. And you'll come up. And then we'll do another one called chair pose. Kathleen, again, can you hold on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, wonder, uh, I wonder, Annie, if you could go back to the mountain pose and, to, and show them how people do it wrong oh, so yeah. they know what's right and what's not right. We do sometimes lean over in yoga, and that's completely okay if you lean over in yoga, but you always have to. Oh, sorry. You always ha it's okay if you lean over in yoga, but you always have to get length before you get depth, and this is a pretty standard position in yoga. If you don't feel like doing it, don't do it. Here, Kathleen. Okay. So this is the mountain pose. So you're, you're up, back, down. See, really good posture. You're using your core muscle to protect your spinal cord. Then you're going to do what I call I dream a genie pose. You're going to lengthen your spinal cord. Get your forehead. You can open up your feet. Your back usually is, you know, governed by everything's connected to everything else. So this one, you open up your feet because it makes your back feel a lot better. You want to pull your skull out of your tailbone and pull your stomach in to protect your back. So always get length before you get depth. If you feel comfortable, you can lean down. Shake your head. If you want to bend your knees, go ahead and bend your knees. But always keep your stomach in. And then your hands go down towards the floor. A lot of people cannot touch the floor, so who cares? You don't try to force yourself to touch the floor or touch your toes. 
Okay. It has more to do with the, the hip flexibility. Right. Yeah, so don't, or they have long torsos and short little legs like me, so I can easily touch the floor. Um, what else did you want me to talk about? I wanted you to show on the two, Warrior 1 and Warrior 2, what people usually do wrong and how to correct um, that. Anything that I notice that people do wrong is they're not lifting up and out of your power, your power center. You don't lift up and out. They slouch over and their stomach comes out, so they don't really pay attention to their their posture while they're doing the poses. As long, this is the only thing you really need to know to do something that's really safe. You're breathing up and you're creating a cushion between each disc and vertebrae in your spinal cord. So your stomach goes out, your, your, your chest opens up and you look like Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt or a president. <laughs> they never slouch. You'll notice that, see, everybody just <laughs> has good posture. It makes you look like you know what you're doing. Okay? So that's I think the most that I've seen are people that slouch and do their poses. Now I'm going to show you. Um, you, you can't, can you do that without? Or are you? I don't want you, to. Well, just, just so they can see. well, slouching is your stomach goes out. You're not really paying any attention. You're looking at your cell phone. Okay. And then you're putting so, your hand on your knee. So you see this That's, roundedness. I'm not paying any attention. Okay. Now I'm paying attention. So foot straight, back foot at an angle. I have really good energy to my feet. That's governing my entire positioning. And then I'm going to lean up, open up. Now, I don't need to look up. If my neck hurts, why would I open up and look up? But I'm going to energize my fingers. I'm pushing my butt forward, and my moving my, my um, uh, skull away from my uh, hip bones. So I'm creating length. Creating length and creating space. Creating length and creating space is what you need to do in yoga. Okay. Great. Anybody have questions about that? Nope. Okay. You want me to do chair? Uh, let me. Um, yeah, go ahead and do chair, and then we'll just run through these slides. Okay. So the, this uh, Annie's running through all three of the principles that we wanted to talk about. The first one was alignment, which is the mountain pose. The second one is dynamic alignment. So can you maintain the alignment when your body, when you're making your body move around? And the third one is le leg strengthening, and we lose a lot of strength in our legs as we get older. And so this, these are some of the poses that are really great for trying to maintain some leg strength. So chair pose is you just get your feet all the way together and line up your big toes. So you can actually lift your toes up, spread them apart, put them down, and then you're going to slide your butt back, and you're going to open up and energize your fingers. See, I want to have my trunk so it's long and my breath so it's deep. Now, there's another way you can do this. You can do this at the, at the wall, and you can open up your chest. Now, can I go back? Can anybody see me from? So you can go in your desk. If you guys are at your desk, you can go like this. And your feet would be separated about hip width apart. But you, again, remember Angelina Jolie. Take your shoulders, move them up, back, and down. Lift up out of your hips so you don't compress your spinal cord. You're going to go down like this. And if you ski, this is one of the best skiing well, I guess if you have really bad osteoporosis, you probably shouldn't ski. But <laughs> um, if you do ski, this is one of the best poses to do. Lift up and breathe into your shoulders. So it's like this. It really, really, really is good to energize your legs. It's a great, great exercise. OK. Is there anything else? Oh, balance on one leg? Um, yeah, we can balance on one leg. Okay, so balancing on one leg, as Kathleen, I think, said at the beginning, um, you can do this. Just take it, take a leg up. And then when I teach my classes, I have you do it with your eyes shut. So you, go, you get really wobbly. Here, I'll, I'll show you. I'll, I'll get my eyes shut, and I'll show you how wobbly you get. So you go tree. You put your fingers together really tight. You look about six feet in front of you on the floor. You move your knee back. You move your pelvis forward. You get a really straight spine. Now watch. I'll, I'll purposely screw it up. See, there's, there's a fight between your right brain and your left brain and your foot and your head. So you go like, like that. But it's really good for you to balance. Now, if you have osteoporosis and you don't want to fall down, hold on to a wall while you're doing it. But it's, it's great to just... 
every day try it try to balance on one foot yep. keep your eyes open most of the time if you're going to fall so one of the most common things that we know that people do when they're balancing on one leg is they when they're doing this dynamic alignment is kind of jut your hip out can you can you show that doing it incorrectly yeah see that so now plug that hip in yeah and that's the body alignment okay but look at my foot so you got to get your foot perfectly straight or you're going to screw up the whole pose everything comes from your feet now watch Okay, very important thing that most yoga teachers don't have time to teach in a, in a setting like Oracle or Google. Okay, so I wonder, Mr. Opp, can we go back to the slides? Is that possible? Mike, can we both go back to the slides? Yeah. They were, they're, so, they're so enthralled with the, <laughs> the discussion. Oh, I didn't realize you had to come back up here. No problem. So it's just this button right here. Do you all have the, did you pick up one of these sequences? So these are stick figures. It's not as nice as looking at Annie do these postures. But you can get this, the, you can start to get the feel for <clears throat> what we're, what it is that we're trying to do. So um, this first safe, bone safe principle, Annie demonstrated beautifully about foot, foot placement and alignment of the spine. And... So you can see that if you practice this mountain pose, and I know when I do yoga uh, classes, mountain pose seems like kind of a silly thing to do, but it actually really starts to improve your awareness of all of the, the alignment. So you see that the ear, the shoulder, and the hip are all in one, uh, in one plane in, in both of these figures. So uh, do you all feel like doing a mountain pose again? Everybody get up. Annie, you want to walk them through again? So with mountain pose, remember your feet are together and your big toes line up. Don't worry about your other toes, just your big toes line up. Now some people don't like getting their feet together as one big foot. So if that's hard for you, you can always modify positions so they feel comfortable for your own body. But also the other thing I notice, a lot of people have tension in their fingers and their wrists. You want to relax your fingers and your wrists. Okay, so let's go. You want to push your feet right down solid into the floor, getting all four corners into the ground, especially your third toe goes down into the floor. So think of it as getting um, a force from the earth and pulling that great force up your body. So start with your feet, pull it, pull it up your legs. Rotate your tailbone under, push your butt forward. Pull your stomach in and up. Lift your rib cage up off of your hip bones in a straight line. Move your shoulders up and back and down. Your power center is now in your sternum plate. That's where you want it all the time. Now lift up, lengthen your neck, try to feel your neck feeling comfortable. Your face might be too far forward, so you just try to move your skull away from your heels. Relax your fingers, shut your eyes, and move and breathe. Now some people can breathe so intensely through their nose that their heels come off the floor a little bit. That's okay. That's breathing deep into your entire spinal cord. Let's do it three times. Good. Good. Okay. Feel Everybody feel feels better. really great. I hope all of you on your, at your computers are standing and doing this. Okay, so the second principle that Annie demonstrated was this issue of dynamic alignment. So we want to keep the normal curves in your spine as you move and maintain pelvic alignment. And she demonstrated how your hip can sometimes, if you stand on one leg, kind of poop out, and you really need to put that, put that energy back in that standing leg and, and stand up straight over your foot and not let that hip sag. So how about a tree pose? Can we get everybody up and do a tree pose, Annie? Um, if you want to. It's, like, it's hard to do a tree pose when you have shoes on. Um, well, I see a lot of people without their shoes on. Oh, okay. If you want to do yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I always teach um, yoga and Pilates with socks off, shoes off, because I think toes are important and highly undervalued in our society <laughs> after we turn six years old. So I like working with my toes. You can spread them apart. Open them up. Okay, I can't do it with this. Oh, here. Um, and I'm not on TV anymore. The slide's on. So 
you can just go all the way up and open up your chest. And remember, that foot needs to be straight, and you have to even out that foot. Shoulders up, back, and down. And then if you want to fall over, you can shut your eyes. But you can practice that at home. It's really, 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 really good for proprioception. Look that up. You're at Google. Google proprioception. OK, breathe. No teeth, no jaw. Close your eyes. I'm always the teacher. I can look. Make sure you're doing it right. We shouldn't have this. The um, I can I can demonstrate that. The slides on. They can't see me. So you can you can, you guys can go like this too. Grab onto your foot. And then if you want to just. Just move that knee back and down, back and down, so you're opening up your hip. And then come take my class at 4 o'clock. <laughs> OK. Yeah, that's good. There's a lot of people that don't have a, very much balance. And so when we go out and do um, community programs, we try to encourage them to, to balance on one leg every day. And the easiest way to remember that is when you're brushing your teeth. Just stand on one leg and see if you can stand on it while you're a little uh, toothbrush is doing its thing. OK. This is uh, dynamic alignment poses uh, that I wonder if, can we get you back up here to, to switch the camera back? Uh, these are dynamic alignment poses that uh, help with the spine, help you improve the spine. You can see that it's cobra and then the locust pose. And Annie, do you want to try to demonstrate that when we get that back on? Yes. Yeah, OK. Yes. So I always teach it um, that we, you know, people, I'll, I'll, t I'll show you how to do it correctly. You relax your feet. OK, so your toenails are on top of your mat. And your chest is, again, wide open, shoulders back and shoulders down. Your hands are on the floor. Your, this, is a, this is pretty much generally good for everybody. And you're just going to open up and breathe. So you're going to breathe right into your upper back and your collarbones. OK, now this is Cobra. I'm going to do it. Cobra is bad for some people. Some people should never do it. But this one, where the one I'm doing right now, is very safe. Every, it's usually OK for everybody. If it hurts, don't do it. Go into child's pose. Here is Cobra, where you open up your hands. You line your thumbs so they're a straight line right into your chest. You have to use all 10 of your fingers. They have to be open like starfish. Jam your fingers hard into the floor. Push down, elbows into rib cage. Now see how I'm doing this? This is I see this done incorrectly all the time. Can you guys see the difference between this and collapsing? You don't want to collapse. OK, now a lot of people can do this, but some people can't. And if it hurts, never do it. And I don't allow people to do it if it hurts. If you want to go into a full on upward facing dog, this is a full on upward facing dog. But again, I am not collapsing. And it doesn't hurt my lower back at all. So I do it. Just stopping when it gets to the point where you're feeling it in your lower back. Yeah, but you do not compress in your lower back ever. But see, the cobra here is this is pretty safe for most people. But since I know Kathleen and about American bone health, I always teach it in those three stages level one, level two, and this is level three. But only for some people, if it feels good, you can do it. OK? It's full on. Upward dog. Now, to release it, you would go into child's pose. And actually, when you go into child's pose, you let your forehead touch the mat. You relax your head. You're automatically breathing right into your lower back. And that's where it needs it the most. That so you want to you want to lengthen. OK? OK, great. What else? Mike. Back to the slides. Yeah. So. Um, these are really great. You remember from those uh, the studies before? There we had a, a study um, slide in here earlier, but took it out because of the interest of time. But there, the pivotal study on fractures and exercise was done at the Mayo Clinic, and they recruited these patients, and they asked asked half of them to do crunches and half of them to do this spinal extension, and 89% of the people who were doing the crunches had spine fractures. 
And the people who did the extension exercises, it was like 16%. So it's really important not to do flexion exercise. That's, that was done in 1984. It will, we will never be able to ever replicate a study like that because who wants to sign up for a study and see if you're going to break a bone doing an exercise? So, uh, but I think it was within a year. Yeah, of doing this exercise. Yeah, they did. They had a group doing crunches, a group doing crunches and flexion, a group doing nothing. Uh, and the, actually, the group that was doing nothing was actually the second worst in terms of fractures. So if you did spinal, the crunches, that was the worst. If you did nothing, that was second worst. If you did a combination of crunches and flexion, that was the the that was better. But the best was this spinal flexion. That's normal age people. No, these are older people. These are older women in this study. How do you, um, what is old? 50 on up? You know, I'd have to, I can, if you want the reference to the study, I can, I can get it for you. It's in a, a different slide deck. Um, this was the third principle that we talked about was leg strengthening. And after age 50, we lose 1% of our leg strength and a half a percent of our bone density every year. So yoga is really, it can be a really critical uh, way to maintain bone density as you get older. So these are the leg strengthening ex uh, exercises that um, Annie just showed you, the warrior and the, the chair pose. And again, if you go to your, your sequence, you can see the little stick figures uh, doing chair pose. And, and, and it's a little clearer on the stick figure that they're not keeping their back really straight and in, in good alignment, that they're rounding over. So these are some of the resources that we brought today. They're in the back of the room. You've got the yoga sequence. The other thing that is uh, really important and actually was where we got the yoga sequence from was from a book that we, we did called Do It Right. And it's a little book that I think I hope you all picked up back there that shows how you can bring your yoga practice into your daily activities. So if you look at some of the pictures of what you're supposed to do versus what you're not supposed to do, you can see that uh, all of the people who are doing it right are keeping a nice straight spine when they take something out of the oven or when they're, they're unloading the dishwasher rather than rounding down and doing a flexion. And there's some, um, there's some core uh, exercises in the very back where you can see the things that you want to try to avoid doing if you're in an, a yoga program. Oh, and finally, we have this really nice piece called Drills for Desk Warriors. And this is really good for all of you because uh, these are some things that you can help improve your posture during the day. You can just do a few of these during the day. And it's, we actually have a screensaver. It's available as a screensaver. So it can pop up and remind you it's time to do a thoracic extension and really try to open up your, your chest and, and get, some, get some life back into your spine when you're, when you're leaning over your desk all day. Okay, so here's the summary of what we want to avoid when we're doing yoga. All forward bends. If you have any, any um, concern about forward bends, there's lots of ways to, to modify that. Uh, again, as Annie pointed out, the, a lot of the problem with forward bends is that people don't have enough flexibility in their hips, so they're rounding because the yoga instructor is saying, touch the floor, touch the floor, touch the floor, so you're ending up rounding your spine and if you have, again, a fragile spine, that's going to put too much uh, pressure on those spine bones, and it could cause them to have fractures. Um, anybody who has low bone density or osteoporosis just should stay away from shoulder stands or plows. If you remember that model of the spine, putting all your weight on those tiny little bones between your, your shoulder blades, if you've got low bone mass or osteoporosis, is just kind of a recipe for a problem. In fact, Sherry uh, Betts, who did this piece as well, uh, had a client who said she was doing a plow and she heard kind of <laughs> as two or three of her vertebrae uh, collapsed. Um, deep spinal twist or side bend. So we're not talking about not doing these things, but what you want to try to avoid, and again, in yoga classes, sometimes you're, you feel a little competitive and they're, they're you know, trying to get you to, to go beyond the range of motion that you can do just 
naturally by moving. So you don't want to torque yourself around. Uh, you want to take it to the end point without like grabbing onto the side of a chair and really moving. Um, so you want to really try to avoid those kinds of um, end range, beyond the end range twist. Uh, some of the people can use pillows if you're doing some of the locust poses or the floor poses. That can really help your under your ribs. And then pigeon pose, again, this is not for somebody who's got healthy, strong bones, but anybody who thinks they may have an issue with bone density probably wants to stay away from putting that uh, enormous torque on the, the neck of the femur, which is where there's the ball in the socket, and there's a little bridge in between the two that is, tends to be where you break your hip. So that forced rotation of your hip can really uh, impact the, that uh, bone pretty badly. So finally, how you can help is you can come to our website. We've got lots of resources. Uh, sign up for our newsletter. We send one out about every month or so. Um, we have a Twitter feed and a Facebook feed, so we try to push out as much information that's coming out around bone health as, as is credible and, and available. And then if you're interested in doing something like this in your community, please let us know. We have a training program where we'll train people to go out and talk about bone health and osteoporosis in their communities. And finally, we did cover a lot, and Annie already mentioned that she's got her 4 o'clock class uh, the, today. Uh, you can always call our hotline if you have any questions. Um, Shelly Powers is in the back. She's the vice president of our board of directors, and, and she handles a lot of the hotline calls that come in. Uh, the website is another good resource. And then Annie's uh, contact information is at the bottom. Annie Yogaforce at AOL.com. And her I also have a Twitter feed at Yogaforce. And I'm also on Facebook um, at Yogaforce. It's all um, one word. So, okay. So I think that's the end of the slide. So I wonder if anybody has any questions or um, comments about what we've talked about today? Yes. If you, the question is, what if you've had some sort of lower back injury or a fracture? And it, it depends. If you've had a fracture, if you know it's a fracture, you really need to be modifying the poses that you're doing. You can still do some of the modified yoga poses, and it's good not to avoid doing, uh, not, it's better to do something, but you want to do it right, and you want to do it with proper alignment and proper form. But you don't want to do that twisting and torquing. Uh, motion because that's going to complicate the complicate the the um, the bones. So are, have you are, are is this for somebody else? So ha have they been diagnosed with um, with osteoporosis or with? Yeah, I think we probably would want, they would want to see a physical therapist or have that further evaluated before they uh, went into some any kind of general yoga um, program. Did you want to say something about that? Um, yeah. D did they get in an accident or hurt their hip in an accident? No, just whether they hurt their, because they weren't paying attention in yoga or their, a yoga teacher got them into a pretzel? Yeah. Um, well, I got really hurt. My hips got out of alignment in a very bad car accident in Los Angeles when I was working at Paramount Pictures. Um, and I fixed it through yoga. But initially, I went to um, an orthopedic surgeon, and I had physical therapy. So the physical therapist told me exactly what to do, and I fixed it. Nothing. No problems. So any other questions? Fused. Uh, the question is, I have a fused uh, cervical spine, and what should I avoid? Four, five, and six. Okay, I'll tell you, never do plow. Um, I will show you what plow pose is, and you should never do this. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> this is plow pose. Okay, never do it. This is shoulder stand. 
Okay, now look, people do this incorrectly all the time because it seems like their legs are straight. So they bring it over here like that, forward. See how my legs are not straight? And then I'm going to pick up and out. Again, I'm lengthening my spinal cord instead of compressing into it. You should never do this either. <laughs> Those are two things you should never do if you've gotten fused, fused vertebrae. Okay, you got to be really careful of your neck. Are you doing some sort of exercise now? Are you doing yoga now? Tai Chi. Tai Chi is excellent for bone health. Tai Chi is really good. That's a good balance and um, strengthening kind of uh, program. That you could probably do some gentle yoga, but you would want to avoid twisting uh, any of anything beyond an end range. Just you know, something gentle. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know what you can do. Um, the the current recommendations. This is it's an argument that we have with the the with uh, the medical the traditional medical model versus the public health model, which is um, we don't do bone density testing until you're 65. And of course, if you're coming at it from a public health model, you want to know when you're 50 where you stand so that you have a baseline before you start going through that, lo that bone loss uh, as you get older. Um, but there is a, f a calculator on the website called the Fracture Risk Calculator. And if you can demonstrate to your health insurance company that you may be at risk for having fractures by going through that tool, uh, you can generally get your insurance company to cover a bone density test. And if you have other risk factors. And if you have other risk factors. Yeah, so there may be something, you know, most of the rheumatologists now are very aware that the kinds of medications they put their patients on affect their bones, so they usually would get them a bone density test. But if you know anybody who's 65 and they haven't had a bone density test, it's covered by Medicare and they really need to, to take advantage of that. Right. You don't. I still want to do those things. I want to. I want you want to know. know. Well, you know what, Sherry, the physical therapist who's on our board says, um, get a bone density test. Do it. And you know that. So you know. Yeah. But it's. Uh, you, did you have? Do you want to add anything? Two, if you are younger and you want to get one, your baseline. It's really important that whoever is prescribing it for you, they know what to do with that information once you have it, and that you're not being given medication or other things that may not be appropriate for you. So that's really important not only to get that information, but to be with someone who knows what to do with that for your appropriate situation. Yeah, so you want to you want to be working with a doctor who knows what to do with um, issues around uh, bone health, bone metabolism. Because there are, as you, you remember the slide with all of the medications and medical conditions, there's a lot of things that we are doing that can impact our bones. So we just, we don't know. And the only way we know right now if we have a problem is breaking a bone or getting a bone density test. So let's see. <laughs> how do, what should we do? Yeah. So you can try. It depends on how much of an advocate your doctor is. There are a lot of gynecologists uh, out there that will let their female patients, you know, around menopause get a bone density test. It kind, it kind of depends. Totally affects men. Totally affects men. Yes. No, there is absolutely a way to reverse that by some of those spine extension exercises. Um, actually, and I think, Sh Shelly, you're kind of a poster child for reversing bone loss, aren't you? Do you want to come over here and speak into the microphone? Well, it's, it's you have to speak into the microphone. It is harder the older you get. So the more active, the more you're doing earlier, the better. Um, but I, I just, uh, I'm 61. And I was diagnosed with osteoporosis at 53, pretty severe. And um, I improved my bone density 10 to 12 percent in the last two years. And uh, a lot of that I can attribute to 
some of the great um, exercises I've been doing. I've added Pilates, and the Pilates is very similar to the yoga in terms of the safe kinds of the, you know, extension as opposed to flexion and, and other kinds of prone exercises like you have in yoga. And so all of it really matters, diet, exercise, and as, Cal, you know, as Kathleen mentioned, you know, our main message, vitamin D and calcium and weight-bearing exercise. And it can make a difference. So, but the older you get, it's, it's, it's harder, but it's still possible. So another kind of interesting factoid, I'm sorry, it's kind of a bonehead thing, is that um, when you're in that time between age 30 and 50 and your bones are remodeling, your skeleton actually replaces itself every 10 years. So these bones that are, they're like really cranking in, in your skeleton, take, you know, chewing out the, bo the older bone and putting in new bone. So there's really, uh, it, it, it's hopeful that you can make a change. So if you can really try to influence those bones, the cells that are building bone, to do more of it, then you're going to you're going to be in a better place as you get older. Yes. There's a well there's a they're not it's not that they're not recommending calcium supplements. There are a lot of studies that are coming out now that are trying are linking calcium supplements with heart attacks. But the studies the studies are are kind of, um, you know, it's hard to know that they're, you have to kind of read the whole study. So it's hard to control for diet. So in some of the studies, it may be that somebody was having a calcium-rich diet, and then they were taking supplements on top of that, which is way too much calcium. So calcium is one of those vitamins that more is not better, and you really don't want to exceed total with your diet plus supplements of 15 to 2,500 a day. So... People, we're really trying to encourage people to to look at their food labels to see if they can get it in their diet. If you can't, basically, if you don't do dairy, you probably need a supplement. It's it's that's the easiest way to get calcium in your diet. So, does that make sense? Good. Anything else? It's one o'clock. It's two minutes to one according to that clock. Well, thank you all for your attention. Uh, as with most minerals, our bodies are meant to get it through food, and so it's safer and better absorbed typically through food, whatever it is that you're trying to you know, get into your diet. So that's why we always say food first, because the better chance of you getting all of what you need. Okay, great. Well, thanks for your rapt attention. We appreciate that.